That intro never gets old, does it, Precious? Never. Never. <laughs> it is Wednesday. It is 3 o'clock Eastern, 2 o'clock Central. Yeah. This is Sell Like a CPCU, brought to you by the CPCU Agent and Broker Interest Group. My name is Matthew Struck. My partner in crime always is Precious Norman Walton. Uh, we don't get too political on this show, okay? But that being said, it's Inauguration Day. Um, we have two firsts. We have a, a female and a black American vice president. Um, is that uh, sitting well with you? I, I, I would think it is, right, Precious? It is. I don't know if you can see the t-shirt, but I'm in full-blown Kamala Harris Madam Vice President mode. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're fangirling a little bit, I, I, I see. I'm fangirling a little bit. Because not only, as you mentioned, you know, the first a woman of color to be in the vice president seat, but also one of, you know, South Asian descent as well. You mm. know, so that's a, another, you know, first, another big moment. So as a fellow uh, African-American Asian woman... <laughs> That's huge, you know. Yes. So I talk about all the time, you know, my, my father's a proud Air Force vet. Uh, my mother's from Thailand. And so, yes, so this is one of those, you know, moments that just not even once in a lifetime, like didn't even think it happened in my lifetime yep. moments. So absolutely, yeah. So a big day, celebrating all day long. You know, you guys are going to get tired of the shirts. So I probably will change them up. <laughs> Don't wear the That's all right. You do you. All four years. Right, right, right. But, yeah, it's a celebration. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I look. It it is a historic event, regardless of which side of the aisle you sit on. Like I said, we don't get too political here, but we definitely have to acknowledge the gravity of the situation. So we have a forty sixth president, um, and now it's get time to get back to work, right? So uh, ho hopefully the drama's done. We're we're moving forward. Um, a reminder that on this show um, we always take comments and questions live. So please. Uh, like the video, comment, subscribe, share, hit the notification bell, and retweet this to put it out. We just added, I didn't even tell you this, Precious, I, for a while I had trouble linking this up to the Twitter feed. So okay. we are live on Periscope right now, too. So we go out on three platforms, Very Facebook, cool. YouTube, and Twitter. So we are live on all three of those. Please make sure to smash the like and share it uh, appropriately. So today, I would like, actually, I will give you the uh, the dais here on, on such a hollowed day today um, to introdu introduce our guest. Absolutely. So super excited to uh, bring to the the platform to our show today, uh, Mr. Jimmy Baker. So he is a fellow CPCU. Uh, he is one who specializes in the uh, DISC, so D-I-S-C. We'll talk a little bit more about that, um, which really just boils down to understanding who you are, your communication and personality type, and how that impacts your ability to deeply connect, to build rapport, and ultimately to sell, right? Because that's what this whole thing is about, selling like a CPCU. So super excited to have you on, Jimmy. Thank you so much for accepting our invitation to join us. Um, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. I appreciate the ability to join you and uh, always looking forward to sharing information about DISC. I know it's helped me tremendously in communicating and sales. And so I'm really excited about sharing that today. Awesome. So now uh, let, let me ask you this before we even get into, we want to talk about, you know, kind of getting into a producer's head or, or at least helping the producer understand what's in their head, right? To, to allow them to be a little bit more effective. What kind of like led you down this path? Were you always in the sales and, uh, you know, the, the, the sales end of the business? Or is this something that kind of like converged by, you know, uh, um, magic or, or fate or something like that? <laughs> Yeah, great question. I've always been in the sales end of the business. And a friend of mine, Brian Flanagan, who was a trainer with Zig Ziglar, in one of his presentations, he alluded to the DISC sales style, uh, the, the system to help you understand other people and understand your own selling style. And so when he introduced it, I did some research into finding a company that promoted that, that taught that, and I became a certified behavioral consultant through them and have been sharing it, teaching it, and using it ever since. So it's been uh, almost 15 years now that I've been working on that. Awesome. And you're also an agency owner yourself? 
Well, I am not currently an agency owner. I'm now a okay. consultant with agency owners. And okay. so I'm an analyst and consultant in helping them grow their business and manage their sales processes. We need all the help we can get. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. <laughs> but with the background and the perspective of an agency owner and as a producer and as a sales leader, you know, so some of that real, you know, again, boots on the ground. This is an all theory. This is practice you know, millions of miles worth of <laughs> road time, you know, tested and true. I shouldn't say millions. He's not quite old enough to be millions, but <laughs> yeah. tons of, of, of data that backs us up. And so it really tackles, you know, at its core, you know, the, the question of, you know, kind of who, you know, what type of, of personality, um, you know, is, is well suited for sales, right? And so- That's right. You know, I would argue that there is no one superior, you know, type that kind of has this lockdown, you know, that is really about understanding who you are, because just yep. like we come in all shapes, sizes, walks of life, so do the prospects that we're engaging. So it's really important yeah. to be a little bit, you know, um, reflective and think about the fact that not only does everyone not communicate the way we do, but everyone doesn't process the way we do. Is that fair? Oh, that's exactly right. You know, when it comes to sales, it's all about the conversation and connecting with the other person. And so if we can flip this around where we know for sure that the customer, the prospect is the center of that sales conversation, mm -hmm. and we as the producer, as a salesperson, we revolve our lives and our perspective around them and their needs. If we can start with that perspective, then we understand this conversation isn't all about me. It's about them and their style and their needs and how they prefer to communicate. So once I understand that, where they're coming from, I can communicate with them in a way that is meaningful to them and not only meet their insurance needs, but I can meet their personal needs as well for acceptance and relationship and connection. Uh, that can be something that I provide. That's extra value that I bring. So that's one thing I love about DISC is that it is a simple, it's a simple system that you can easily walk into and understand and then apply to your everyday life when it comes to selling and helping people. So uh, right off the bat, we have a sales opportunity for you, Jimmy. We got Matt Maxwell asking uh, if Jimmy's a published book author because uh, it's clear you know your stuff right now. So are you published, Jimmy, currently? Nope, not yet. All right, we we gotta we gotta check that one off the list. We we gotta All get right. there. <laughs> Don't ask me to ghostwrite it though, because it'll come out like gibberish. <laughs> so so let me ask you. So um, in terms of the the actual process of um, you know breaking this down and understanding kind of like where where the fit is or or kind of what the diagnosis is, so to speak. Um, What's step one? Like right out of the gate, how do you kind of like get going on the, the, the path of this process? Well, one of the very first steps you have to take is uh, to understand yourself. Once you understand yourself and your own method of communication and how you interpret what people say, then you can better apply that to helping other people. So one of the best places to start is to take a DISC profile. And uh, they're very simple. You can find them online. They're not expensive. And it helps you understand where you fall in this four-profile uh, four system. Once you understand that, uh, then the, the floodgates open up. Then you understand how to connect with other people and how they prefer to be communicated with. So do you have any prepare? Uh, like, we, we, we always disclaim, like, we're not, um, you know, advocating or, or, you know, marketing for any particular provider or anything like that. But in terms of doing disk profiles, do you have a preferred vendor free option? Like, where are you usually going for that for your clients or, or directing them? Really, what the place that I go actually is just having a conversation with somebody. This is the most free place. So here's what I'll share just very quickly. You can determine for yourself what your style is. There's four different styles, D, I, S, and C. Each one of these stands for a specific dominant style in, in you. So D is the dominant, the driver type person. 
Uh, are you quick to make decisions? Are you uh, always jumping in with uh, leadership ability? Are you someone who uh, doesn't like small talk? You could be a D. The I is someone who is an interesting, engaged person. They're very socially active. They love exciting things, uh, usually a shorter attention span, usually a lot of words to share. So that's the I, very mm. exciting person. The S prefers more stability. They like a, a steady path. They like things to be laid out. They don't like sudden unexpected change mm. and they value relationships. So the S is a, a very easygoing person. The C finally is, uh, this is your detail oriented, analytical process oriented person. So right there from the start, everybody will have an idea of what their dominant style is. We all have a little bit of all four, but everyone has one or two very dominant styles. Once you understand that, it, it's wide open. It, it helps you know how to connect with others and understand yourself. Awesome. And so, you know, to his point, you know, and I'll speak, you know, firsthand as a consumer, because uh, we did, you know, at my agency, you know, reached out to Jimmy and had him come in and do a presentation for our sales team. Uh oh, we lost your audio. <laughs> hold on, hold on. There we go. You know, okay. I'm gonna the gremlins are at work today. <laughs> right, right. You, you, you think that I hadn't done this before? Okay. <laughs> so we we had Jimmy come into our agency and you know do a profile to all of our producers and give a teach back on you know kind of understanding um, you know which you know by answering a series of questions. Of course, we got a report and it really kind of gave an analysis of where we fell on the spectrum. Um, you know, what some of the things that, you know, because, of course, as he read that out loud as salespeople, you know, typically we gravitate towards maybe one or two of those letters that really resonate. Um, but, you know, understanding not only where we, you know, have our, our dominance, but being able to identify that in others. Um, so, you know, in the sales world, we talk a lot about buying cues, you know, being able to ascertain kind of what's the biggest pain point, what is the motivation of you know people that we we're talking with and and understanding how do we tailor our message um so that it's going to also resonate with the the recipient right because if you have someone who's not price conscious if that's not the concern then it does a little bit of digging to reveal what is the you know the biggest priority here and you know i, I laugh you know i started off the show talking about you know my mother is from thailand and, you know, throughout my childhood, she's, you know, bilingual. She speaks both Thai and English. And, but she has an accent, of course. She spent the majority of her life overseas. And so we would go places and people would literally, like, speak, like, they would raise their voices to speak to her. And when I got to about high school <laughs> age, you know, I had to remind people, she's not hard of hearing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 She's not hard to hear. She actually comprehends and understands English very well. You're the one who's perhaps struggling with her accent, but she is not struggling <laughs> with yours, right? And so, you know, I, I carry that forward even with, you know, again, when we go back and we, you know, listen to calls and see what went well and what didn't go well, you know, and I tell people, like with the language barrier, if someone spoke Mandarin Chinese really loud to you, you probably wouldn't have an increase in understanding. So if you're trying to close someone in the way that you want to be closed and it's not working, the key is not to double down. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's my follow up question, right? So um, I, actually, I I have two, um, and I'm sorry to cut you off, but like you just gave me so much where I'm like, oh my god, I have like 18 questions. Um, the first of which is, can any of those be a producer, an effective producer, right? Like in your estimation, can a D, an I, an S, a C dominant person become a producer or effective producer? And then the other question is, is the key then to try and get like people that are D dominant people lined up with prospects that are D dominant people? Or is there a different dynamic there? Yeah, great question. So uh, any of those styles can be an effective and very successful producer. It's not one over the other. Every one of them can be successful and every one of them can be a miserable failure. So <laughs> it, it, it goes both ways. Equal yeah. opportunity. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. So it, you don't have to line up 
D candidates with a D producer. Mm. The responsibility falls on the producer. The producer needs to operate under a uh, needs to be met mentality. And that's mm -hmm. a, uh, I don't know if you were familiar with the jobs theory or jobs to be done. Uh, it has to do with innovation and understanding what people need. And so you give them what it is that they need in order to get their job done. So this is the same approach. What does somebody need from me? What need are they trying to get met? So when I think about that, I can tailor my approach to meet their needs. So here's an example. If an I style comes into my office and they are uh, looking for a quote or they have a, uh, they have a question, they want to know about something that I'm selling. Mm -hmm. The I, I know I can recognize them right from the start because they're going to come in with energy. They're going to come in with a big smile. They're going to want to talk to everyone in my office and they're going to come and talk to me. Most likely there's going to be stories. There's just going to be a lot of fun conversation. When I recognize that, I need to know that for them, they need to do the talking. I need to do the listening. And I just have to make sure I approach them with good questions that make them stop and think. And then when I do that, when I allow them to be who they are and express that in the way that they want to express it, they're more willing to trust me and share that information with me. Mm. That's interesting. So um, you know what that reminds me of is, I, I don't know if you're a poker player at all, but um, that's actually something that was like right at the heart of most people who want to play competitive poker. The first thing that they do, or, or hopefully they're doing to be successful, is one, they're, like you said, identifying what kind of player they are, right? Like, so whatever they project or their decision making process. And then the other side of it is trying to put your, your competitors into one of a handful of different profiles to understand what their propensities are or how they are easiest to, I wouldn't use the word manipulate, but they're, they're easiest to kind of like find their weaknesses and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the first thing that kind of can't, comes to mind. So, um, but, and, and that makes sense from the standpoint of, all right, we're not just trying to take like one personality type and line it up with another one. What we're trying to get people to understand is, and, and correct me if I'm I'm correct in my correct or wrong if I, in my in my assessment here, we're trying to get people to understand who they are and the fact that like if normally they would railroad another type of personality type, they mm -hmm. shouldn't, or mm -hmm. in some cases they actually should let that dominant personality type loose because it will result in a favorable result is it is that kind of like is that close to accurate or am i off the mark you're you're right on with that that's exactly right so a friend of mine is a c he's a very strong c so mm. he's very detail oriented very analytical and i have seen him time after time sit down in front of a customer or get with a customer over the phone talking about uh, life insurance or auto insurance and what he does is he shows them 27 different options you here's everything that's available to you and by the time that prospect leaves the office or gets off the phone they they don't have anything to say their their brain is drained they don't have a response because they didn't he's communicating with them in a way that's important to him he cares about the details in every option the other person didn't you know show me one or two uh, if he had been talking to a C, he'd have been speaking the same language. But when he's talking to a D who, hey, I got to get this done quick. I don't have much time. And he goes through his 27 options. He's going to lose every time. Right. Yeah. So uh, a couple pieces of feedback here that we got from the crowd. Um, Heather said, know thyself so you can mm -hmm. know others. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that sounds like that's spot on. Um, and it's much like knowing your audience, Matt Maxwell, mm -hmm. as a public speaker and working to understand their current needs. He's actually, uh, so Matthew Maxwell, my first introduction to him, uh, he had mentioned that uh, I guess maybe he was introverted or, or, or very kind of reserved. And something that he went through was Toastmasters, was mm -hmm. a way to mm -hmm. kind of like open up his communication and make him a better communicator to, to larger groups or, or just groups in general. Um, is that something that you advocate for is, is uh, you know, kind of if you are one of those more introverted, um, you know, like personality types, 
you know, trying to kind of like get a little uncomfortable, <laughs> so to speak. I, I agree because like I mentioned, we all have all four styles inside of us. Mm. And sometimes what we need is something to come and stretch us and challenge us. And so when we get challenged in a way that in something that we're not comfortable, it does allow us to grow. And so there have been experiences in my life, just like with everyone else, that have pushed me outside of my quiet or analytical method of thinking and has allowed me to expand who I am and understand um, more about how to communicate with people. So Toastmasters is a fantastic way to grow in that area. I definitely agree. Awesome. And sales in general. Sales yeah. is a challenging activity, right? That can push you to your limits sometimes and, and uh, really challenge you, especially if you're more of a reserved personality type. It, it'll it'll yeah. push you to get out of that. I, Precious, have you, I, have you been, did you go through the process? Because you said you brought Jimmy in. Like, did you go through the process yourself or yeah. was it mostly for the sales team? Um, both. Um, when when yeah. Jimmy came and worked with our agency, uh, both myself and the agency principal, we took the assessment. We read the results. We got involved. So we we fully participated in the activity. And it was really interesting because, you know, a lot of the same things that apply to sales, hands down, apply to leadership. Mm -hmm. We're selling every day. I'm just not mm -hmm. taking credit cards. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna sell. You're gonna sell them on running over the hill, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, I've got to sell them on trusting me. I've got, you know, so we're, we mm -hmm. all are in some kind of sales capacity, which is why, you know, when it comes to understanding communication styles, even though in this application we're talking about, you know, um, transactional, you know, insurance sales, um, mm -hmm. but I'd recommend it for any professional. You know, because we need to understand the way that we come across to our direct reports, to our supervisors, to our peers, um, you know, because, you know, to his point, you know, something as simple as like maybe, you know, presenting a budget or, you know, a, you know putting forth a requisition. If, if you're too heavy handed, if you, you know, to borrow Matthew Maxwell's words, you know, if you don't know your audience, if you can't read a room <laughs> and so you don't know how to you know, structure that appeal. So I was very eye opening because, you know, there's so many things that, you know, when you just kind of hear very superficially the description, you're like, oh, that's me. You know, that's me too. And especially in the insurance realm, I would argue that, you know, amongst CPCUs, you know, we're all to some degree, we had to in order to get through the curriculum, you know, <laughs> very attention, you know, detail oriented and very factual. Um, but I think the fork in the road where a lot of us made our career decision was, you know, or how risk averse, you know, do we like, you know, being forward, you know, customer facing, do we prefer being behind the scenes, we want to troubleshoot, you know, kind of, because I have colleagues all the time that say, well, yeah, even though we have the same formal training, I can never do sales. I wouldn't right. be any good at sales. I don't I don't like that. And so that's usually the excuse. I don't have the personality for sales. I'm like, well, yeah, everyone has a personality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tapping into it, obviously, and leveraging this tool, which is what it is. You know, it's not going to give you the magic. There's no, you know, spoiler alert. There's no Jedi mind sweep here that he's going to show you that you can do where automatically people just roll over and mm -hmm. give you credit card numbers. <laughs> but, you know, especially in those areas where, um, to his point, as you're doing this discovery conversation, which we all already do, when you're listening even for, you know, what it is that they really, you know, I mean, body language is difficult in a COVID environment. You know, we're all virtual right now. And so, you know, even just, you know, as you're talking to someone, if they tend to perk up when they're talking about certain things and, and want to kind of rush it when they get into certain parts of the conversation, you can be extracting all these little bits of data to piece together. Because you can't say, hey, prospect, you know what, before we hop on this call, you mind filling out this disk assessment. And then once I get it from you, <laughs> once I know who you are, we'll come back to the table and talk then. So it takes going through the process and recognizing what it entails to try to, you know, figure out really quickly on your toes, how am I going to use this this info now to maybe yeah. change my approach where it's more, where it resonates better? That's yeah. a really interesting question that now comes up in my mind is like, Jimmy, are you arming the sales professionals that you're working with, with some kind of like conversational hacks 
to figure out where people are coming from in terms of their like can you train them to do like a moderate like disk profile on the fly from the prospects that are coming up to them you know for the first time that they're seeing them yeah you sure can there's some pretty pretty significant telltale clues that you can watch for hmm. so uh, for example a d is generally going to be short on time they will probably be speaking louder than other people always <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, and they you feel attacked tendency... right now matthew I'm just <laughs> <like you. laughs> and there's a tendency to interrupt yep. so that they want to say something they have something to say and they want to say it quick and they want to make a decision now so typically you can pick up on that at, right there at that first interaction with somebody and I is someone who they will generally, more than others, talk about themselves, what they've done, who they know, where they've been. They have stories. Most likely they're going to be entertaining. They're going to have people laughing. They like to get other people engaged. They're going to know a whole lot of people, but their relationships may not be very deep. Their, their relationships are very broad. Mm. So the I is uh, very animated in their talking. There, there's a lot of hand motions, voice inflection. The I is pretty easy to pick out. The S, some telltale signs for them. When you're in that discovery conversation, if you sense that they're really pushing the brakes, they're really slowing you down, uh, you see walls coming up uh, when you start getting close to asking for the sale, or when you start asking probing questions, if they don't trust you yet, those walls are going to go up and they're going to share less with you. They also resist change. They hate change altogether. And so they're going to push back on anything that feels like, um, it feels like, uh, what's the word? Uh, not change, but um, confrontation. They're going to push back on that. They don't want to, that invasion into their privacy. The C, their big thing, is they're going to ask you lots of questions. They're going to want to know details. And yeah. a roundabout number isn't good enough. It's got to be exact. Don't tell me it's about $100. It's $101.36 every yeah. six months on the 15th at 12.01 a.m. They're going to yeah. want to know every detail. Yeah. So the, the C is going to push for those, those very small issues that they need to know about. Yeah. No, that's really interesting because that's that's extremely valuable. I mean, the the ability to be able to kind of like analyze on the fly and get a really quick read of the room or the individual is huge value. Um, are 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 firms bringing you in to talk to service staff too? I would think that that's also pretty valuable when it comes to not just the selling but also the servicing side of things. Because also the service staff might be dealing with someone who's not the decision maker, right? So the decision maker might be a D, but the, the person who's actually doing the day-to-day -day operations that your service team is working with might be, you know, an IS or C. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And with service, you also have the potential of dealing with people who are frustrated. They're angry or they have a problem that's not resolved. And it, if you can quickly understand where someone's coming from and what their dominant style is, you can help to diffuse the situation and bring them down. So mm -hmm. this is really valuable in a service situation for sure. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I, so I, how was your experience with it, Precious? Was it, uh, did it take a while? Was it, was it, was it pretty quick or, or is this like a, a long process in terms of how it plays out? Well, not to get all into, obviously, his proprietary approach and secrets here. No, no, no. We don't want to give away any trade secrets. No, no. <laughs> so, you know, um, the, the approach that we took was kind of structured over um, a, a series of, of individual, you know, meetings, right? And so we took the assessment prior to the first get-together, you know. We talked about, I think maybe at one point, you know, just kind of some of the, the overarching. We gave everyone a chance to not just take the assessment, but also to read the report, right? Mm. So they got to kind of see the ins and outs. And then we came together and talked a little bit about pretty much what we're talking about right now, the application of it. So now that you have this, you know, this is not a horoscope, right? 
<laughs> this is tailored to be applied to what it is that we do, which is selling and servicing insurance. And so, you know, to your point, um, because we did include the entire staff. So we had our service mm -hmm. staff participate as well. And, you know, we did see some trends, right? And so when we saw some trends and, you know, we even, you know, kind of shared, okay, you know, who, you know, who had the highest marks in this letter and that letter. And, you know, it was, it was kind of a fun time, you know, because we're a small, tight-knit group. We're like, aha, I figured you for an ass. Oh, yeah. You totally did. <laughs> and so then, you know, we really kind of spent some time internally looking at just our interagency communications, right? Mm. And so you're like, okay, you know, if this person kind of leans this way, then, you know, I need to be more cognizant of when I give details, I need to be more explicit because like you said, they need the step-by-step -step. or this right. person is more kind of a visionary and they just want the high level, right? And then, you know, again, like, is it taking it a step forward and talking about how do you apply this to to closing sales, uh, because that's something that we say very often in the sales community, that if you listen actively and properly, people will show you how to close them. Mm -hmm. But you have to be, you know, what is it, the adage that, you know, again, it, it can't just be waiting for your turn to talk. You've got to be actively listening, using what's being said and preparing for how you're going to plug that in and you know seal the deal and so this really just puts you in the mindset of this one is going to want to talk and brag give them a chance to do so let mm -hmm. them build some endorphins mm -hmm. <laughs> get them feeling really good about this mm -hmm. but this one is you know my question and answer they're looking at it as some sort of interrogation yeah you know if, if i go too yeah. long with the q a they're going to feel more and more like i'm digging into their space without permission you know, right. so just even, you know, everything that he's, you know, sharing with, with us right now were the things that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So part of it was group conversations. Part of it was more, you know, for people to think about, you know, as they read it on their own. And then a lot of it were kind of next steps. Now that you're armed with this information, how are mm -hmm. you prepared to go into your next conversation differently? Yeah. yeah. You know, one thing, too, that we covered in there was how you can sabotage sales. And I remember <laughs> talking about that and, and looking at each of the different styles of the different people on the team and talking about how each one of them could just trash the sale without even meaning to. So the D has a tendency to push hard for a decision quick. I mm. want to close this. I want to close it now. And I want to close it big. And when they do that, when they push like that on an S and a C, they're going to shut down and they're going to walk mm. away and they won't come back. And I is going to forget that they're trying to close anything. They're going to yeah. engage with a person and have so much fun. It's a party, a conversation. Woo, this is great. And then they are a professional, uh, a professional conversationalist. There's no end to the conversation where it comes to a close. The yeah. S hates confrontation. And they feel like closing is confrontation. So what yeah. do they do to sabotage? They don't ever ask. Because yeah. asking is too pushy. And they don't want to be pushy. Yeah. And then the C, the way they sabotage it is they give you every detail along the way. They tell you everything <laughs> and they drown the person in, in the whole handbook and all of the... They can't take yes for an answer is the problem. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So uh, we, we have very educated uh uh, viewers. So um, we have some some really good questions for you. So first of all, Heather, by the way, shout out to Heather, 530 Eastern. Check us out on how to CPC you later today. We're going to be talking about claims interest group. Claims people, I think, could also probably be helped by some of this, uh, you know, disk profiling in terms of speaking with, you know, the insured or, or even speaking with the, the other entities that are involved in the claims process. But Heather wanted to ask, have you, uh, have any of you utilized or completed the Berkman assessment? It gauges how you work within teams and interact with others. Have you ever kind of included that, Jimmy, or, or been familiar with that? I, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, the company okay. that I have used, they do have a teams assessment. Mm. Um, in, in, 
did there uh i know you don't want to push anything so if you don't want me to say who they are or where they are I, I, you can mention it we'll just say, say like you know everyone make your own buying decision so we're not we're not saying that they're the bee's knees or anything so I'm, <laughs> I'm not i'm not pushing i don't get anything from it but discinsights.com they have a team assessment individual assessments leadership assessments they're all there um, but i will look that up the berkman assessment it sounds interesting yeah yeah no i i Again, I got another one here for you. We got Matthew Maxwell. Sorry, I'm blanking out Jimmy's face here on the feed. But to continue with the Know Thy Audience mantra, I would be interested in getting Jimmy's feedback if on if and how often he finds ethnicity or different cultural uh, cultures being a common driver towards any one of the disc dominant styles. Um, and he's just saying he's asking from personal faith. Um, or, or, or uh, in good faith from some personal experiences I've had over the years. So do you see kind of culture playing into the disc profiles as well? Uh, that's very interesting. I've had suspicions about that, and I don't <laughs> necessarily have anything to back that up, but I've had suspicions, especially on the analytical side. Uh, you can see some cultures really tend towards uh, the, the data uh, and data analysis and uh, that type of of uh, field. So hmm. that's a very interesting thought. I, I don't have anything to back that up, just some general observations. You know, yeah. that's a really good point because, you know, when, when I do some of the, the sales training that I do, I, again, drawing from personal experience from, you know, my background and, and, you know, growing up as a military, you know, brat, we traveled a lot of places. And so my mom, for example, you know, in Thailand growing up, you know, going to market was like a regular activity for them, right? And so we would go somewhere and literally first table, first vendor right out the gate might have what she's looking for. But it's a thing where she was like, you never buy the first time it's offered. Mm -hmm. We're going to go, we're going to shop around because I would hate to find it three booths in for half the price. And like, I have to know, right? Yeah. And so, you know, kind of that, that recon that we have to do before we make a buying decision, you know? And also, you know, there are some places where, you know, I've seen that the whole concept of being sold is the equivalent of being taken advantage of or being had, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You let them sell you on this. You're only supposed to buy what you've independently verified you need and then stick to that, you know, very much the con, you know, the mindset of you need to go to the dealership, you need to have a budget, you need to have all this and don't let them upsell you, you know. And so I've run into that before, too, where, you know, people, you know, I think, you know, Matt and I have this conversation, you know, repetitiously that the whole idea of being upsold in certain industries is viewed as a negative, is viewed as being like oversold, right? Yep. Whereas in insurance, oftentimes it may be because a new needs discovered, you know, as we're doing this risk analysis. And so it's not that the extra sale is frivolous or unnecessary. It's just that maybe the buyer wasn't even aware that that, you know, that was going on. Um, yep. But yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because of course, DISC gives us a very, you know, high level, you know, just idea in terms of communication. But, you know, that's the whole, you know, premise of speech, right? You have a message, you have a sender, you have a receiver, you have these filters. Mm -hmm. There is a myriad of things going on. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're trying to make a sale, are they having a good day or a bad day? Did you eat breakfast? You know, are you hangry? I don't know. So now we've got to, <laughs> exactly. to you know, integrate all those things too. But yeah, so I think that's a, you know, really good call out that this is a guide and a tool, mm -hmm. but it's not going to be the end all be all and it's not like anything in sales nothing is 100 percent definitive you can't say i've got your number i know who you are hold on stand by you know <laughs> downloading clothes oh this pitch you're not gonna be able to say no let me go ahead and get this out to you it's still going to be subject to you know there's going to be yep. you know some things there that's so yeah. true you know people are complicated and you can't pin them down on just one thing and think you've got them there's so many factors involved. That's exactly right. Yeah. So uh, Heather wanted to elaborate on the Berkman uh, methodology. Looks like Berkman really digs into your productivity drivers, the support you need within a team, how you operate under stress, and what are your true areas of interest. And hmm. it would it's it's pretty wow. fitting that Heather asked that question because she's um, part of the the change change management team where she's working. Um, and so I would think that's also uh, both both DISC as well as Berkman are probably really effective in 
trying to at least head off or or you know kind of smooth out that that system of change that right. happens as well because we, what's interesting is and I'm I'm sorry I'm kind of like wandering in the left field on this one but um, a lot of times when larger companies make communications to their employees. Um, they make it the same way to all of the employees, <laughs> which mm-hmm. is probably a big mistake, right? Like if if you are someone who is somewhere on that disk platform, or or depending on you know what what uh, what Berkman would would kind of like lay out for you, you know, telling someone in a mass email might work for one fourth, but the other three quarters of people think the sky is falling, right? Like, um, so that's that's something that's that's pretty interesting. Interesting, but I guess maybe that's a topic for another day. I think my my next question would be, when it comes to aligning sales professionals with niches, right? Like trying to find where they are going to have a really uh, well targeted, successful experience or career. Mm-hmm. Um, does DISC help you? Because immediately I think back to like my educational background and I went to school for engineering and, and I was a math and science nerd as a kid. So like when I go and talk to math and science type people, they are very much that like analytical numbers, I's dotted, T's crossed kind of group. Mm-hmm. You know, they're they're the accountants and the science, uh, you know, the, the lab rats of, of the population. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me for characterizing folks as lab rats, but um, I, I myself was one, so I can use the term. Um, there you go. But <laughs> but so, does it really help them kind of narrow down where you're like, look, you're you're of this personality type. You really shouldn't be going after contractors. Maybe you should be focusing on accountants and engineers. <laughs> yeah, that that's a really great point because it does help. Uh, but in a, in a slightly different vein. So mm. the direction that I would steer somebody in is if, you, if you're hiring a producer or you're managing producers and you need someone who's going to go out and they are going to drive business in. I mean, they're going to go out and hunt it down. They're going to go get recruits. They're going to get leads. They're just going to be persistent, hit roadblock after roadblock and just keep on pushing. You want a D. Or you want an I who are going to do yep. that. This doesn't mean that the S and the C can't do it. It just means you want to put someone in where they can use their natural magic, right? That That's where they're going to shine. A D and an I are going to shine in something like that. But if you need somebody who's going to be there, who's going to work with your internal customers, your internal book for multi-lining or upselling or any of those conversations, you may want to put someone in who is – is happy with sitting there in front of the computer day after day, working diligently, following a process, going through a list, they're going to be the ones who will be more successful. You put a D or an I there in that role, and uh, they're going to be changing something. They're going to color outside the lines. They're not going to follow the process. They're going to do it the way they want. And by the time yeah. they're done a month later, they're going to be having a conversation over here. They're not going to be they're just going to flip the say. desk over. <laughs> 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 so you can use this to put somebody in a place where they're going to be more successful. I agree. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm tapped out. I mean, technically, I could ask questions all day long, Precious, but <laughs> I I'm tapped out. I mean, is there something else that you want to kind of focus on here? Because I think I just just from having this conversation, I don't understand why a sales organization wouldn't have this analysis done because. This is like I, I gotta say, with all of the um, with all of the systems and all of the training programs and everything like that that's out there. Like you said, precious, you could have the most amazing assumed close on the face of the planet, but if you're giving an assumed close to someone who is very much detail oriented and things like that, they are not going to sign on the bottom line. It's just going to fall on deaf ears or the, that, that recipient is going to be turned off to that process. So, I mean, from my standpoint, I don't understand how a sales organization wouldn't bring in someone like Jimmy to do this kind of analysis. Um, but yeah, I mean, anything else that kind of like I glossed over any questions that you had precious for Jimmy? So it's really interesting because I've seen organizations that like pre-hire you know, use some of these, you know, um, 
uh, screening personality tools, assessments personality and stuff. assessments yeah. and over the years confession I've always cringed at them um, apparently I don't do so well on paper <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, if you talk to me you'll love me but I don't know what it yeah. is I think I'm too much of a pleaser where I'm trying to give them what I feel like they want from me and and maybe I'm not consistent I don't know but I've never really done well in that environment so I don't really give much credence to kind of the pre-assessment um, but I really think that it's vital you know especially when you have people who um, maybe not onboarding but maybe once they're you know <clears throat> as they're ramping up right because this is a tool that can be used for a lot of reflection internally and this is also a tool that can be used when you're sitting down and you're having that one-on-one -on -one, you know mm -hmm. because it's really hard to proofread your own stuff and so if, if you share even your assessment with a colleague, a peer, you know, a supervisor, they may be able to help you kind of, you know, make some of the modifications that, you know, are in these blind spots that we have, you know. So, for example, the Toastmasters example is amazing because one of the things that Toastmasters is they immediately call you out for those filler words, the ums and ahs, right? Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll ding you for those. You don't even realize you're doing that until you mm -hmm. go back and you hear yourself. And you're like, wow, I didn't realize that was a thing. And so in this environment, if you have someone who is maybe struggling or, you know, trying to figure out a new approach, you know, to, again, up their game, then this is a really good foundation. So it's money well spent. I'll definitely, you know, say that because it's an investment into the longevity. Um, you know, Jimmy is very forthcoming and saying this again, back to the whole, you know, Jedi mind sweep. This is not like the magic fix. You know, you're not right. instantly going to walk out of here. It's going to be really what you do with this knowledge, you know, mm -hmm. that you have. And so sales, you know, we've already kind of discussed is really helpful for everyone. I would even argue that if someone is at the crossroads of making a career change, this would be a really helpful tool for them to kind yeah. of reevaluate where they, you know, best align so that they can try to find things that, you know, kind of fit and feed those areas where they, you know, they do well. I had yeah. a lady that I worked with some years ago, and as you were talking about, you know, kind of the in-house roles and the, the out and about roles. So there, there were two different individuals. The first one, amazing on the phones, very strong closer. So we had the opportunity to go set up a booth at an expo and we got out there and she froze. So it was something about not having, you know, over the phone, she had a little bit more control over the environment mm -hmm. and the situation, mm -hmm. but just being out there and having to like, you know, get in front of the table and go grab someone, hand them a lollipop, say, hey, come back to the table with me. <laughs> like that was not, you know, her comfort zone. Yeah. And it was really odd to me because I just assumed that the, you know, environments were comparable and that she would flourish and it didn't happen. And then yeah. vice versa, I had a colleague of mine and that was the very first time I'd heard the term desk jockey. And so that's how she referred to us in the office. She's like, oh, this is my first gig as a desk jockey. I was like, did she say disc jockey? Are we having a party? I missed them. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, no, no, desk jockey, because she was a social butterfly. She wanted to go out there and kiss the babies and shake the hands mm -hmm. and collect the business cards and toss them back to somebody else in the office who would, you know, put together a proposal so that she could go over it over half the hour. You know, she wasn't much for the details. And that was, you know, that was her thing, you know. So she didn't want to be, you know, combing through deck pages and doing a side by side, you know, coverage, you know, comparison. <laughs> she wanted to be out yep. there where the action was and it bored mm -hmm. her. You know, and so as a as a hiring manager, as an agency, you know, leader, if you have you can have all the right players in all the wrong positions on the field and still yeah. lose games. Mm -hmm. And it has nothing to do with who you drafted, it has everything to do with how you're utilizing them. And yep. so this is a really yeah. good, you know, place to start. Such a great point. And I saw a comment come across earlier about C's and S's will need different support. Uh, th that's exactly right. So e in my opinion, even more important than your people taking this, you as a leader or your leader over you really needs to take this and understand because when they know how to interact with their team and they know how to interact with each team member and place them in a role where their magic can shine and they can do their thing and what they touch turns to gold, then, then uh, that's a good leader. And when a leader mm -hmm. understands this, they're going to be more successful at putting their people where they'll shine. Yeah. 
No, that's a that's a great take home. That's a great take home. Um, all right, I want to be respectful of your time, Jimmy. I know we have a hard stop here in a couple of minutes. Um, where can people go to find out more about you and uh, the services that you're providing as a consultant? I appreciate that. You can find me on LinkedIn and then also uh, cypresslearninggroup.com. You can find my website there and uh, check us out and get some more information. My email address, phone number is there as well. Uh, but LinkedIn, I'm active there, so you can find me online. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah, anyone who ends up watching this, if you are live and uh, uh, current returning, or even if you're a new uh, viewer, definitely hit up uh, Jimmy online and connect with him um, and, and find out some more about his service offerings. Um, Jimmy, I want to say thank you very much. I appreciate your time in this you know day and age where all of us are uh, very, probably more busy <laughs> than, than we've ever been. Um, you know, the, the blessing and the curse, right? Like there's yep. no commute, but at the same time, all that commute time is now uh, work time. So yeah. um, I want to say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, any parting notes, Precious? Anything you got to uh, leave with the audience here? No, you know, I just hope that, again, it all, you know, makes sense and that, you know, whether you reach out and connect with Jimmy, which, you know, again, this especially coming from a fellow CPCU uh, means a lot, um, or, you know, you seek out your own resources, but really, really consider this. And if you haven't explored this element, you know, there's no better time than the present. So that's, that's my takeaway. Awesome. I appreciate I, that. Thanks, Sean. It's been an honor to be here and I appreciate the time. It's been fun. Yeah, uh, I, I will have to have you back on again sometime. I, I know there's more digging that we can do here for <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. um, but uh, so quick reminder, 530 today coming up in about an hour and a half Eastern. We have uh, how to CPCU. We're going to be talking about the claims interest group. Again, claims folks are, are really important to the insurance ecosystem. Um, so make sure to check that out. Uh, also, next week, we will be here yet again, as usual, Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern, 2 p.m. Central. We will have, who is it, Holly's coming up from First Insurance Financing. Is that right, yeah. Precious? Absolutely. Yeah, we got we got Holly Lipmeyer coming up from uh, First Insurance Financing next week. So again, another Salt Lake CPCU you, you do not want to miss. Thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic week. See you guys. Thanks, Bye.